James Leninger was born in April of 1998. By all accounts, he was a perfectly normal little boy. Playful, spirited, happy, and he loved airplanes. He loved airplanes to the point that it bordered on an obsession. While his friends played with toy trucks and tractors, all James cared about were airplanes. Every year for his birthday and for Christmas, or really any other occasion, he would be treated to a cascade of new airplane-related paraphernalia. Models, books, gliders, you name it, James had it. He also loved going to aviation museums, and he eventually grew to learn most of the planes there by name. Especially World War II-era fighter planes, which he had a special fondness for. Then, when James was about two years old, he began having severe nightmares. He would often wake up in the middle of the night, screaming hysterically, saying that he was trapped in a plane that had been shot down and was crashing into the ocean. At first, his parents believed that these nightmares were just nightmares and nothing more. But as time went on, James fleshed out more and more details of the dreams. He said that the pilot's name was also James. The plane was a Corsair, a well-known World War II fighter plane, and he even named the aircraft carrier he'd been on, the USS Natoma Bay, which turned out to be an actual carrier used in World War II. James's parents started to believe that these dreams had a significance beyond just being mere nightmares. They began to pore over World War II records in an attempt to make sense of the dreams, eventually coming to the conclusion that the man in his dreams was a World War II pilot named James, who was shot down at Iwo Jima. In fact, they even took it a step further. While he loved planes, James had little knowledge of World War II battles. The TV he watched was mostly Teletubbies, and the family never watched any World War II-related television, nor did they ever talk about it. As far as they knew, he shouldn't have had any knowledge of the matters depicted in his dreams. So, where did it all come from? After extensive research, they settled on reincarnation. They believed that the recurring dreams James was having were actually memories from a past life. From his past life. So strongly did they believe this, that in 2009 they wrote a book called Soul Survivor, detailing their experiences and eventually cementing James's story as one of the most compelling and well-known cases of reincarnation. But his story is far from the only one. This is Simply Strange, a podcast where anything spooky, weird, and goosebump-inducing is fair game. Hello there, and welcome to episode 14 of Simply Strange. I'm your host, PJ, and as always, thank you so much for joining me on today's weird little journey. This is a wild one. I don't know exactly how common this is, but it's something that definitely happens to me fairly regularly. And according to the internet, there are plenty of other people who experience it as well. Whenever I'm really violently assaulted with something that I just don't understand, something that reaches the highest possible levels of bizarre and incomprehensible. I get these really intense shivers that kind of run through my head and my eyes start to tear up. It's weird. It's not sad tears. It's just this involuntary response that hits me. Anyway, it's a response that's reserved only for things that really deeply unsettle me. And when I first started reading about this week's story, the floodgates really opened. So hopefully this story freaks you out just as much as it did me. This is the story of the Pollock twins.
John and Florence Pollock were a young couple living in Hexham, a quiet market town situated among the gentle rolling hills of Northumberland, a county in northern England. The Pollocks were devout Catholics and loving parents, and they seemed to have built themselves the kind of lives that many other young couples dream of. Together, they ran a successful grocery and milk delivery business, they had three wonderful children, and in 1951, Florence gave birth to their fourth child, Jacqueline. Growing up, Jacqueline and her sister Joanna, her elder by five years, were nearly inseparable. Their parents were often kept busy running their business, and much of the girl's time was spent in the care of their grandmother. And during this time, Joanna enjoyed playing mother to her younger sister. The two girls would often play dress up, transporting themselves to fictional lands with narratives crafted mostly by Joanna. They loved to comb people's hair, especially their fathers, whose begrudging acceptance they found endlessly entertaining. They were great kids, kind to others, kind to each other, and always willing to share. When Jacqueline was three years old, she had a nasty fall, landing on a bucket and sustaining a gash on her forehead over her right eye. A gash that would eventually leave a slightly depressed scar. But the accident did little to crush her spirit, and before long, Jacqueline was right back at it, enjoying her happy, carefree life with her family and her beloved sister. By all accounts, the Pollocks were in a great place. They were well off and living happy, enriching lives. But then, on the morning of May 7th, 1957, tragedy struck. The Pollock family was preparing for church, as they do every Sunday morning. Joanna and Jacqueline, eager to be on their way, were dressed and ready to go, while their parents and siblings were still wrapping up their morning routines. Then, as the girls anxiously waited for their family to get ready, there was a knock at the front door. Their friend, nine-year-old Anthony Layden, had stopped by on his way to church to see if the girls wanted to walk with him. Typically, the family would walk together, but since the girls were ready to go, and it was only a short walk up the road to get to church, their parents begrudgingly agreed to let the girls walk with Anthony. John told Joanna to keep a close eye on her younger sister, and the three set out, holding hands as they enjoyed the beautiful sunny spring morning. Then, just a few short minutes later, the neighbors heard screeching tires and a frightening crash. While the Pollock family was spending their morning getting prepared for church, about 10 miles to the east, in the town of Horsley, 51-year-old Marjorie Wynn was having a far less ideal morning. Wynn, whose husband had died five years ago, had recently been forcibly separated from her two children. And today, she snapped. She swallowed what she believed would be a lethal amount of aspirin and phenobarbitone in an attempt at suicide. But when that failed, she instead got in her car and began driving extremely erratically with the intent of committing vehicular suicide. By a cruel twist of fate, Wynne eventually ended up in Hexham, near St. Mary's Roman Catholic Church. Witnesses in the area report that she was driving erratically, and in her depression-induced, drug-fueled frenzy, Marjorie Wynne suddenly directed her car straight towards Joanna, Jacqueline, and Anthony. The three children, who only had a split second to react and were blocked by a barrier along the sidewalk, had no chance. The car made direct contact with all three children, launching them into the air killing Joanna and Jacqueline instantly, and severely injuring Anthony, who ultimately died in the hospital a short while later.
We all look at death a little differently. Every culture in every era has had their own set of beliefs, with a seemingly endless number of possibilities as to what exactly happens when we die. And others simply believe that nothing happens. John Pollock had a rather unique view on the afterlife. While he was a devout Catholic, his version of Catholicism had a bit of a twist. He believed in reincarnation. In fact, he would even pray to God to somehow be shown proof that he was right, and that reincarnation did in fact exist. News of Wynne's crazed attack upon the children made headlines all throughout England, and her ensuing trial was closely covered by the local paper. Understandably, John and Florence Pollock were devastated by the deaths of their beloved daughters, and the two of them both dealt with their grief in their own way. At first, Florence was inconsolable, falling into a deep bout of depression that lasted for months after their loss. But eventually, as time went on, she tried to avoid dwelling on her grief, putting it all behind her and attempting not to think too much about their lost girls. But John, on the other hand, did the opposite. He found solace in prayer and took to spending time in the top room of their house, where he felt that he could still feel the lingering spirit of his girl. In fact, John felt that he had some sort of connection with their spirits believing that he had seen a vision of Joanna and Jacqueline in heaven on the day that they died, and he maintained hope that someday, somehow, their girls would return to them. A notion that Florence found outrageous, and wanted to put a stop to so that she could move on. The pain of their loss and their difficulties in dealing with it created a rift between the two, damaging their marriage and almost causing them to get divorced. But then, in early 1958, to both of their excitement, Florence became pregnant again. But to her dismay, John continued his strange conviction that the spirits of their daughters were not gone. Despite the fact that the doctor believed Florence was pregnant only with a single child, John believed that she would give birth to twins, and that somehow, through these twins, their lost daughters would live on. And then... Strangely enough, despite the doctors claiming that all signs indicated there being only one child, on October 4th, 1958, Florence bore twin baby girls, Jillian and Jennifer. To John, this was complete vindication of his beliefs that Joanna and Jacqueline's spirits had somehow lived on, and now they were being reincarnated in Jillian and Jennifer. And... This was just the tip of the iceberg, because shortly after they were born, upon further examination of the baby girls, John immediately noticed that Jennifer, the younger of the twins, had some birthmarks that were very similar to marks that Jacqueline had, the most notable of which was a birthmark above her right eye, all the way down to the bridge of her nose, very similar to the scar that Jacqueline the younger of the deceased sisters had sustained when she fell and hit her head on a bucket. And at this point, John was completely convinced that his daughters had been reincarnated. But Florence remained skeptical. Shortly after the twins were born, the Pollock family moved from Hexham to another town called Whitley Bay. And it was here that things became very strange. And the events that were about to unfold would stretch Florence's skepticism to its limit. As soon as the girls were old enough to speak, they began exhibiting unexplainable behaviors often asking for and describing toys that their lost sisters had owned. At one point, Florence actually gave them a pair of dolls that had belonged to Joanna and Jacqueline. And to her astonishment, the twins immediately recognized the dolls, stating, that's Mary and that's Susan, the exact same names that Joanna and Jacqueline had given them. The twins should have had 
no idea about the existence of these toys. Following their daughter's death, John and Florence had boxed up most of their old toys and stored them in the attic, out of sight, out of mind. And the twins knew nothing about them. In fact, the twins didn't even know that they had two older sisters who had died. When the twins were three years old, their parents felt that the girls had reached an age where they may appreciate the toys that were boxed up in the attic, and that maybe they were ready to face these lingering reminders of their lost children. So they brought the toys down to give to the girls. The excited twins sat on the floor with the opened box and began sorting through it. But not exactly how you would expect them to do it. There was no arguing over who would get what, no mad dash to get all the toys out of the box. Instead, Jillian carefully began to select the toys that had belonged to Joanna, and Jennifer the toys that belonged to Jacqueline. As they did so, they would make comments about the toys, like, Oh, Santa Claus gave me this one. Or, There's my toy ringer. And to their parents' astonishment, all of the observations that the girls made were accurate. Before long, each of the twins had amassed their own pile of toys, with each pile consisting entirely of the toys that belonged to their corresponding older sister. Older sisters that they still didn't have the slightest clue had ever existed. And from here, the strange coincidences and behaviors continued. Their parents claimed that the girls liked the same foods and games that their older sisters had, that they had similar personalities and mannerisms. At the time of her death, Jacqueline had been struggling to learn how to write. She had developed a bad habit of holding the pencil upright in her fist, and had been having a lot of trouble shaking the habit. Interestingly enough, Jennifer, too, developed the habit of holding her pencil in her fist, and it ultimately took her several years to shake it. Over time, John and Florence witnessed a multitude of examples of the girls knowing things that they simply shouldn't have known. They would often be overheard discussing the details of the accident, despite the fact that John and Florence still had yet to tell them about their older sisters. And usually when they did this, they spoke as if it had happened to them. There is one particularly ominous incident in which Florence found the girls, with Jennifer lying with her head in Jillian's lap, while Jillian cradled it. While she did so, Jillian worriedly stated, The blood's coming out of your eyes. That's where the car hit you. And the girls did seem to have an irrational fear of cars. Cars passing by on the street terrified them, so desperately that their parents were barely able to gather them up to walk around town, and crossing the street was an exceptionally difficult task. On one occasion, John was walking through an alley with the girls when a car started near them, and the girls were so startled that they jumped in fear, held on to each other, and began crying, The car, the car, it's coming for us. There was also an exchange in which Jillian pointed to the birthmark on Jennifer's head and stated, That is the mark Jennifer got when she fell on the bucket. Which was true, except that it was Jacqueline who had fallen on the bucket. When the twins were four years old, the family visited Hexham. It was the girls' first time being there since the family had moved away when they were nine months old. One afternoon, John and Florence were accompanying the girls around town, and as they reached the crest of a hill near the family's old church, the two girls turned to each other and asserted that their old school was around here, the school that they used to go to. Which, again, was half correct. The school that Joanna and Jacqueline went to was right around the corner. But Jennifer and Jillian never went to school there, in fact, they had yet to even reach the church that day. The twins had never seen it and shouldn't have known about it. But here they were, as they had so many other times, knowing things that they shouldn't. Seemingly courtesy of some strange, unexplainable connection that they had with their lost sisters. John and Florence were completely baffled, but the family continued walking. The girls skipped happily along, completely unaware of their parents' bewilderment. Soon, the family reached the church, 
And across the street from St. Mary's Church lies the sprawling green grounds of Hexham Abbey. On these grounds lies a playground that Joanna and Jacqueline used to play on. It was actually quite near where the family was walking, but their view of it was completely obstructed by the rolling hills of the abbey grounds. And then, one of the girls excitedly turned towards John and Florence and exclaimed, Oh, the playground's over there. By this point, with all of the strange occurrences, John and Florence were convinced that there was only one possible explanation for the odd coincidences in the twins' apparent knowledge and access to their sister's memories. That Jillian and Jennifer were reincarnations of their lost daughters, Joanna and Jacqueline. Even Florence, despite her skepticism, had finally come to accept this as the truth. Given the bizarre nature of these stories, they eventually made their way to local newspapers. And with the increased exposure, the Pollock family began attracting the attention of researchers, one of whom was a psychologist named Dr. Ian Stevenson, a man with an impressive resume of research on child reincarnation cases. Dr. Stevenson began investigating the case in 1964 and remained in touch with the Pollocks for the next 20 years. During that time, he uncovered quite a few interesting details on his way to becoming one of the leading authorities on the case. As part of his research, he ran blood tests on the twins, which determined that they were identical monozygotic twins, meaning that they had identical genetic material. As such, the fact that they did not have identical birthmarks is somewhat unusual, although certainly not impossible. What's even stranger, though, is the correlation between the proximity of Jennifer's birthmark and Jacqueline's scar. While all of this is certainly very compelling, there are quite a few details that go against this case. For one thing, the only witnesses are John and Florence Pollock. British historian Ian Wilson, a skeptic of the case, believes that it is entirely possible that, despite their insistence that they didn't, John and Florence did speak of the older sisters and that the twins gained their supposed supernatural knowledge of their deceased sisters through perfectly normal means, and that John, viewing the situation through rose-colored glasses, saw what he wanted to see and eventually even managed to convince his wife. Or they could just be lying about the whole thing. Wilson proposed as an alternate theory that perhaps the twins' actions were an example of maternal impression, a phenomena in which a powerful mental influence in the mind of a mother can create an impression in the mind of the child, or in this case, the children, that she is carrying. By this logic, the twins would have inherited the memories of their older sisters from their mother, a theory that seems just about as likely as reincarnation. Ultimately, despite the obvious issues and skepticism directed towards the case, like John and Florence Pollock, Dr. Stevenson eventually came to believe that, for a number of reasons, there was enough evidence for the case of the Pollock children to be deemed an authentic case of reincarnation. One reason for this was the highly improbable correlation between Jennifer's birthmark and Jacqueline's scar, a pattern that, as it turns out, can actually be seen in a number of other reported reincarnation cases. He also believed that Florence, even in her skepticism, noticing the strange behaviors and phenomena to the point that she eventually came to believe in reincarnation herself, was very telling. And finally, he believed that there was no way that the influence of their parents could have left so strong an impact on the girls that they were able to so accurately reiterate the behaviors and memories of their older sisters. Dr. Stevenson believed that with this case being so far beyond any other rational explanation, that the only remaining possibility was that of a higher power, and that Jennifer and Jillian Pollock truly were their older sisters reincarnated.
As time went on, the twins' strange memories of their past lives became fewer and further between, until they were about five years old and the memories seemed to stop completely. From then on, the girls were able to live relatively normal lives and the strange events of their younger years ultimately had very little impact on them. In fact, they didn't even know about the strange statements that they had made and their father's belief that they were reincarnates of their older sisters until he finally told them when they were 15 years old. According to Dr. Stevenson, they came to accept their parents' beliefs, but they themselves were skeptical of the validity of their claims and of reincarnation in general. But there is one final twist to the story. In 1981, when Jillian was 25 years old, she began to experience a series of lucid visions. In these visions, she saw herself playing in a sandbox with her brothers. Around them was a house and a yard that she had never seen before. But later, after having described the dream to her parents, the location seemed to be an exact match to their home in Wickham, the town the family had lived in prior to moving to Hexham. Jillian was able to perfectly describe not only the house, but the garden, the lawns, and the orchards of the home. A home that she had never seen. A home that only her older sister, Joanna, would have known about. Alright everyone, well, as always, thank you so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed this week's episode of Simply Strange. And if you do enjoy the show, and maybe know someone else who you think might also enjoy the show, be sure to tell them. But only if you want to. No pressure or anything. But if you do, that would be awesome and hugely appreciated. So thanks for that. Uh, you can find Simply Strange on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook at Simply Strange Podcast. So be sure to follow us there if you haven't already. And when you do, let me know what you think about this week's episode. Or just stop by and say hi. Drop me a quick message. Either way, that would be awesome. And that's it. That's all I got for you guys this week. Thanks again for listening. And I hope you all have fantastic, glorious wonderful, joy-filled days.